Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar on COVID-19 risk and food value chains. Uh, it's being co-hosted by the CGIR Research Program on Policies, Institutions, and Markets, better known as PIM, and the Food Security Portal. Uh, speakers will be discussing the results of several recent studies on how various food value chains are responding to the um, pandemic, to COVID-19. Uh, my name is Nick Minot. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Markets, Trade, and Institutions Division at IFPRI, and I'll be the moderator for today. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to submit them in the side panel at any time where it says question box, and then I will read them during the Q&A session after the presentations. Please note that this uh, webinar will be recorded. The slides and the recording of the session will be posted on the PIM website uh, after the webinar. Um, I'll introduce each speaker as they come on. Um, to begin with, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Kyle Hirvonen. Uh, he's a development economist and senior research fellow at the Development Strategy and Governance Division at IFPRI. And he's here to talk about food consumption and food security during the COVID-19 pandemic in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Uh, he'll be using a unique panel of uh, a unique panel survey of um, a of households in Addis Ababa, uh, and this research was funded by the CGR Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, uh, also known as A4NH. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, Kale. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, so yes, we'll be focusing on on Addis Ababa, where we'll be doing these surveys uh, over the over the year. And this is joint work with uh, Gasha Tadese Abate and, and Alan Depro, uh, my IFPRI colleagues. So some background for those who are not following in Ethiopia very closely. Uh, I think Ethiopia has managed this pandemic fairly well. Um, in the first three to four months, there was a quite slow increase in the, in the infection rates. Uh, then it picked up through community transmission. But uh, earlier this week, when I checked these numbers, more than 100,000 uh, have tested positive, 80,000 have already recovered, but uh, 1,755 have, have lost their lives um, during this pandemic uh, because of the virus. Uh, but considering a population of 100 uh, plus million, I think this, this, uh, these uh, numbers are, are pretty good. Uh, most cases have been in the capital, uh, Addis Ababa, which is the focus of our study today. Uh, so some background on, on the government response. It was very uh, swift after three days of the first confirmed case. Social distancing measures were in place, school closures, banning large gatherings and so forth. There was a very strong awareness creation going on on preventive measures, hand washing, face masks and so forth. And then one month after the, the first uh, the case, uh, which was around March, uh, the state of emergency was declared, kind of more, more again, highlighting the, the importance of and, and the seriousness of this, this issue. But it also came with provisions that prevent uh, the prevented layoffs and evictions of tenants. Uh, Ethiopia has a strong social protection policy in place, and uh, the, the flagship the urban and rural safety net programs and uh, these uh, safety net programs in the urban areas were expanded fairly quickly and, and there were also new food banks uh, that were set up. Importantly, the uh, thing that might explain some of our findings, findings is that the country never went into a full lockdown that we've seen in some other countries that have severely restricted movement of, of people and, and goods. Uh, so we build on a, on a surveys that we've been doing just before the pandemic, where we try to understand uh, food consumption outcomes in, in, in Addis Ababa, the capital of, of Ethiopia. Uh, the first survey was administered in October 2019, and the second, uh, February 2020. Then the pandemic began, and we switched to phone surveys, where we followed 600 households in, in May, June, July, and August. We managed to keep the attrition rates quite low, uh, less than 5%. These surveys focused on, on self-reported income changes and, and food and nutrition security. But in, in the August round, we administered a comprehensive consumption module, uh, similar to what, uh, what is administered by the World Bank and uh, 
and the national statistical agencies when they, they measure consumption and, and to construct poverty measures. So we did this uh, similar and identical module in October 2019, February 2020 and August 2020. And it allows us to compare the situation before the pandemic and, and during the pandemic. So, so quickly, uh, already jumping to the findings, uh, we find that there was a quite high adherence to the recommended practices when it comes to hand washing, social distancing and, and uh, face masks. But at the same time, it was a very stressful time for the, for the households in Addis. Uh, here in the, in the graph, we show uh, the statistics from our question where we asked uh, whether the households, uh, we asked the households to, to evaluate their current stress level uh, with a scale from zero to 10. And, and we see that in each round where we asked this question, at least 35% of the respondents reported being extremely stressed. When we disaggregate these findings by the asset levels that we, we, we collected before the pandemic began, we see that these stress, uh, high stress situations are more con concentrated on the, on the uh, poorer households. We asked uh, the typical question that we've seen in these phone surveys is that uh, whether there has been a change in income levels compared to the usual, uh, usual incomes during this pandemic. We see that uh, in each round where we ask this question, more than 50% report a loss in income. And again, uh, these, these uh, income losses, uh, the reports uh, are concentrated on, on the poorest households. But if you look at the richest households based on their uh, pre-pandemic asset levels, almost more than 50% uh, report income losses. We then move on to food security outcomes, uh, looking at food household uh, dietary diversity score which is a widely used measure of food security uh, and it groups food consumption into 12 food groups, uh, cereals, vegetables, fruits and so on. And uh, for each food group that the household consumed in the last seven days, uh, the household gets a point uh, one and then we add them up and then a maximum being 12 uh, food groups. So in this graph, we regress this household dietary diversity score on the household wealth index where 10 uh, uh, captures the richest households in our sample and zero the, the poorest households. There are two lessons here. Uh, we see that the dietary diversity score increases with household wealth uh, index, which is not surprising. Richer households are able to afford a more diverse diet. But then again, when we compare the situation before the pandemic and, and during the pandemic, uh, we see that there is virtually no change in the dietary diversity score. Uh, I should also say that even the poorest households in Addis are consuming a much more diverse diet than we usually see in rural areas. So in the areas where the Productive Safety Net program operates in the rural areas, the average score is usually around four food groups. Then we look at the comprehensive food consumption data that we've collected. Uh, we compare the means uh, in sep uh, between September 2019 and August 2020. There is virtually no difference, and the difference is not statistically different from zero. Uh, also, the, the distributions uh, are almost identical, overlapping, as we show here, uh, where we show that the household uh, per capita consumption uh, in there, and, and we've taken the logarithm of it, and we see that uh, they are fairly, fairly similar, identical across the two survey rounds. But it could be that the households kept their consumption uh, budgets the same, but changed the, 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 the composition of their uh, food consumption baskets. We see some evidence of this. Uh, the consumption of staples increased uh, and consumption of pulses and vegetables decreased. But we don't see any, any changes, uh, significant changes in other food groups. And the story is, is very similar if we measure consumption in, in calories in terms of uh, uh, real uh, uh, real co uh, consumption expenditures. Then you might be interested in to understand how the situation differs when we compare those households that reported income losses and, and those who didn't. And but we don't really see much differences between households uh, between these two types of households. And the same story holds if we look at the households that reported job losses and households that didn't uh, during the pandemic. So in terms of uh, conclusions. In summary, we find that uh, there was a high awareness and adherence uh, to the recommended practices, uh, but at the same time, very stressful time uh, for the households and especially for our households. 
but despite this very large uh, uh, reported uh, prevalence in, in the reductions in incomes, we see little change in the value of food consumption, uh, calorie contact, or, or dietary diversity when we compare September 2019 and August 2020. We think that our results are uh, suggestive of that the initial shock of this pandemic in Addis Ababa was temporary, and the households were able to cope fairly well, and, and, and the urban PSNP, the safety net program, may have also helped in this regard. For researchers, uh, I think we need a better measurement of the magnitude of the income loss. Uh, so we use the measure that, uh, that many others have used, uh, which has the simple categories of much less or somewhat less uh, uh, income than, than usual. This seems to be not adequate uh, for this type of work that we're doing. So it, it might be that it might be better to, to invest a little bit more and, 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 and try to measure consumption uh, uh, like we've, we've done here. And then the implicit, uh, there's implicit evidence that the agriculture value chains have appeared to be quite resilient to the pandemic because households in Addis Ababa do not produce their own foods. And, and, and the work we've been doing in the vegetable value chains in, in, in Ethiopia seems to support uh, this finding as well. So that's all I have, and uh, back to you, Nick. Well, thank you, Kali. Um, that was very interesting, and, and uh, it's nice to see a moderately optimistic take, uh, not optimistic, but positive take on, on uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, next, I'm pleased to introduce Sudha Narayaran. Um, she is uh, Associate Professor at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research and also a former IFPRI colleague. Uh, she will speak about food and agriculture in India during the pandemic, uh, bringing together three strands of research on agri-food supply chains uh, following a very strict uh, nationwide lockdown imposed um, by the government of India in March of uh, 2020. Uh, and there's only been sort of a gradual relaxation of that uh, lockdown since then. Uh, with that, over to you, Suda. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I think India probably presents a bit of a contrast to Ethiopia. Uh, I'm going to start off with some background on the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, even when it's set in, uh, in India, everyone talked about a health crisis and an economic crisis. The first case was detected in end of January. Uh, but the government of India took action fairly early on. So if you look at the graph, uh, the, uh, the government of India imposed a lockdown uh, uh, when the cases had just begun. So it was fairly early action, but one of the problems was that it was very sudden and uh, it was dramatic in its suddenness. Uh, and the, there was a nationwide lockdown imposed on March 24th. Uh, and the government actually uh, implemented a very, very restrictive and rigorous lockdown. And uh, what it seemed to uh, be was that uh, they announced it. And after that, they began to take action, which was mostly corrective. Uh, and I will just give you some instances of the suddenness and how it caused the agricultural and food value chains to completely unravel. So uh, I want uh, us to remember that uh, the immediate impact of the lockdown was a massive economic crisis where migrants returned to rural areas and the entire economy imploded and in fact it was kind of cataclysmic in terms of impacts on livelihood but we have to remember that the health crisis continues to unfold and India has the second largest number of cases worldwide so we are not over the hump yet. Uh, now, the food supply chains unraveled dramatically. And to give you an instance, the announcement was so sudden that fishermen who went out to sea, by the time they returned the next morning, they found they couldn't sell their fish. Likewise, truck truckers who were uh, crossing state borders could not continue anymore and just parked their vehicles at the highway and left home. So that was the kind of suddenness, and you can imagine the consequences. And this affected every little element in the supply chain. So farming operations, farmers couldn't access their own farms. Migrant labor had gone home, so they couldn't access labor. Machinery shops were shut. And uh, the spot markets, which is a, a dominant place where the first transaction happens between farmers and traders, they, they were closed. Also, because they are crowded spaces, they became hotspots. Village itinerant traders stopped coming, and when they came, they were reluctant to procure because of the risks of movement. Uh, transport challenges, I've already talked about it. Costs had increased, labor was short, 
uh, there was a shortage of labor and uh, so too with warehouses and cold storages agro processing demand went down because they couldn't find labor and at the retail end yeah, demand had collapsed because hotels and restaurants were shut exports had also collapsed and uh, and this is partly because i think we need to remember that two things are going on one is labor shortages and transport restrictions and together these two with a, uh, both a demand collapse as well as supply constraints and plantation crops and animal products was particularly hit uh, especially because in the early days there were rumors that uh, the pandemic was spread because it, it it came from animal source foods so these were the things that were working against the agri supply chains and increased dramatically the risks and the costs associated with uh, supply chain uh, operations and if you look at it uh, the these are the mandis which are regulated markets for uh, spot markets for agricultural commodities you see the sharp dip in the number of mandis that were functional it recovered somewhat uh, but, but you look at the arrivals and you see that after the lockdown there was a huge dip in arrivals and it actually coincided with the winter harvest season so that was something of a big problem uh, because at a time when harvest was coming in there were not enough markets open uh, and then uh, you would think that if uh, arrivals collapsed uh, prices might increase because there's a supply constraint but uh, you see that the prices farmers received crashed and this is what i'm showing you is a index co constructed for 40 crops uh, and it's a three day moving average it started recovering in early august but you, uh, that huge the three month period was quite brutal for the farmers who weren't getting any prices um, now it seems that uh, this is uh, consumer prices presents a contrast so on the one hand you see farmer prices collapse but in the cities that we look at where for which we have data available we saw a huge increase in prices and uh, it's useful that in the context of india we had a deflationary trend until then and the lockdown actually reversed these trends and to date we are seeing continuing inflation now there are two points here that are quite interesting that the wet price wedge between the retail and wholesale prices increased dramatically indicative of supply chain uh, frictions the other thing is that the small towns were far more affected by uh, higher prices than were large towns so uh, what seems to have happened uh, very oddly is that farmer, uh, farmers faced a collapse in prices and consumers faced a spike in prices, uh, suggesting that all the demand collapse in the large cities were passed on, the costs of that were passed on to farmers in the form of lower prices, and all the supply chain costs that were there were passed on to the consumers in the form of higher prices. Now for these, we used mainly reported published data uh, but we wanted to understand what was going on with the supply chain actors and, and among farm households. So we conducted surveys uh, uh, of uh, retailers, which was face to face, and uh, we did a farmer telephone survey. And unfortunately, this was largely, uh, uh, it's a very modest effort and more of a dipstick survey to understand what was going on. Uh, and this was done entirely by student volunteers. So uh, what I'm presenting is actually their uh, effort during a time when uh, police often used to stop them from getting out. So I appreciate their effort. Uh, I'll come back to the animal product prices a little bit uh, later. But I just wanted to, uh, the point that I made is that the supply chain frictions, which you see in the form of higher transport costs, uh, continued through three rounds. So we conducted three waves of surveys, April through July, and you find that while uh, supplies were now more available uh, and transport was also, the uh, constraints had released, you still had labor problems and huge transportation cost increases that uh, hadn't really uh, uh, eased uh, over the three months. And uh, even though demand had gone down, and uh, traders had to pay a higher price for their produce, the consumers uh, were charged more or less the same prices. So this kind of validates our uh, idea that the costs were basically uh, borne mainly by farmers and consumers. The animal products is a little bit different uh, because you see fish and meat, the prices increased greatly because they were practically dysfunctional and meat markets, even when 
food the vegetable markets were functioning the meat and the fish markets actually took a huge beating uh, the eggs and the uh, chicken actually there were rumors uh, because of which demand collapsed and prices were lower uh, milk we don't see much of an effect because it's primarily driven by cooperative dairy and so we didn't see much of an impact there see on the whole you see that uh, consumers and farmers face the brunt now uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion in the popular media saying that agriculture was the least affected uh, and uh, so we decided to do the survey across nine states in india just to get a sense of what was going on uh, because many migrants returned to uh, rural areas and agriculture was actually their fallback option and the uh, idea was that perhaps uh, farm households were doing better and there uh, we found that actually close to a quarter had to borrow food rely on others for food or skip a meal in the past one week and this uh, the survey was staggered between april and may and uh, finding diverse diets and adequate quantities was also a problem and as you can see the other indicators are also uh, also suggest that uh, farmers also had to absorb a lot of shock and in fact because of the small holding size many farm households also depend on wage income so they were not immune to the economic shocks that were, were released because of the lockdown uh, and uh, in terms of uh, insights and concluding remarks i think the dominant discourse in india was that we have resilient uh, agri food supply chains and to some extent that's true i think two things stand out one was the role of the state uh, where, where the state procures a large uh, amount of food grains and that was in full swing because it was the harvest season we also have a big public distribution system through which in kind uh, food transfers were made um, and these really helped uh, keep cereal prices and pulse prices somewhat stable many states also innovated so a lot of state governments uh, actually started supplying grocery kits to households which included both decentralized uh, procurement of vegetables and uh, controlled prices but also small things like tea packets and all and milk so all of these actually help keep up uh, producer prices for these products uh, the other big uh, 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 interesting uh, occurrence is this role of FPOs and agri-tech firms. So on uh, food tech, or orders from restaurants fell dramatically, but e-commerce actually, e-grocers, uh, uh, that, that increased substantially by 27%. But the problem was transport restrictions and labor. Uh, but you see a lot of interesting experiments. FPOs reached out to market their produce directly to consumers. And many uh, restaurants actually uh, pivoted to selling grocery produce. So that was an innovation that actually we see some of that continuing in different forms. So that's a bit of an adaptation story that we need to watch. Informal food retailers have actually been the bulwark of our uh, recovery. And uh, many people who lost their jobs actually became uh, street vendors of food and uh, tra local transporters actually uh, changed their vehicles into vegetable vending uh, uh, stalls and things like that. So we see a lot of this actually contributing to the resilience. At the same time, it's also a resilience with a certain kind of vulnerability. And we don't have much uh, reliable data to go on in the way uh, you have for many other countries. But the one uh, data set we have suggests that overall food expenditure year on year this July was down by 12%. And uh, dairy, eggs, meat, uh, cereals, all of them have not completely recovered. And this is something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, and of late, inflation continues to rise, even though producer prices have remained somewhat stable. Uh, the rise in inflation is also a cause for worry, with the uh, economy not showing any signs of recovery. So here again, I'll go back to the point I made in the beginning. But we have both the health crisis and an economic crisis that are ongoing. And we'll have to really watch carefully to see how this pans out uh, further on. Uh, I'm happy to take questions and I'll just hand it over back to Nick. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suda. Uh, that was a fascinating description of um, how the economy responded to very, a very strict lockdown um, starting in March. Um, before I introduce our last speaker, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that you should feel free to submit your questions to the question box.
Uh, we'll have a roughly 30 minute question and answer time. Uh, and if you have a question for a specific presenter, please put their name into the uh, question so that I can direct it to the right person. So last but not least, I would like to introduce uh, Ben Belton. He's an associate professor of international development in the Department of Agricultural, Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. He's also a senior scientist for value chains and nutrition with World Fish based in Malaysia. Uh, he will present his research on tracking the progress of COVID-19 impacts on the fish sector in Nigeria um, based on a pair of high frequency phone um, surveys. Okay, over to you, Ben. Thanks, Nick. So as you said, I'm going to present uh, World Fish research conducted in partnership with Michigan State University uh, and colleagues there and in Nigeria on COVID-19 impacts on fish value chains in Nigeria. Uh, next slide, please. So we have two surveys currently ongoing. Um, one is being implemented by World Fish, it's part of the Fish CRP, and it's actually a six country survey where we're tracking about 790 actors in fish supply chains across six countries. And Nigeria is one of these uh, where we have 95 respondents and they're mainly in the southwest of the country, which is the main uh, fish growing area around Lagos. You can see that circled in red. Uh, and the second ongoing survey is with MSU and World Fish that's funded by PIM. And we're tracking about 550 fish and poultry supply chain actors in eight states. Um, and so that covers all six geopolitical zones of Nigeria. And we're looking at those supply chains together because there's a lot of similarities and a lot of overlaps between them. Um, so the objectives of both surveys are to track the quantities and prices of uh, fish and poultry that are being produced and traded and also of the inputs into fish and poultry production. Uh, and to understand access to inputs, access to buyers and transport and labor for businesses throughout the supply chain. Uh, also, particularly in the, the, the MSU World Fish Survey, focusing on challenges faced by those businesses um, and on whether any assistance has been received. Um, so this is a phone survey. Uh, we did recall surveys in, in May and June, uh, covering the period February, April, and then monthly surveys uh then onwards till the end of the year next slide please um so this graph is is showing the, the sort of short-term effects of the lockdown versus the, the longer term impacts on demand um so the the blue line here is the percentage of uh supply chain actors or respondents who reported that they attempted to buy or sell products and you can see this really drops off very shortly in march and april but then recovers quite quickly um, and similarly, uh, the, the percentage of people able to access transport uh, or access inputs when they needed them uh, drops off very sharply, but then um, recovers within sort of uh, around three months or so. Um, but there's a much longer term um, impact on demand. So the yellow line is the percentage of people who reported that they were able to find buyers for their products when they expected to. Um, and you can see that even sort of six months later, um, things have still not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similar pattern also for the percentage of businesses reporting uh, hiring casual labor. And so you can see a sort of V or, or U-shaped recovery here in terms of the number of businesses who hired casual workers. Um, and there are sort of different impacts on the supply side uh, during the uh, March and April, May, uh, laborers were unable to travel to work because of lockdown and transport restrictions. Um, so those restrictions were then eased. Um, but we also know uh, from our surveys that even though businesses have started to hire workers again, they, they, they tend to be hiring fewer workers. They're attempting to uh, reduce costs uh, because, because business is down. Next slide, please. And so really the challenges that people reported experiencing have evolved over time. So uh, as you would expect in April, there was a sort of peak in the number of people reporting challenges and uh, the, the greatest challenges in April and May were to do with uh, lockdown movement restrictions, curfews and so on. Um, and then over time, we have low demand uh is is becoming an increasing problem and then also uh 
cash flow problems, the lack of access to, to finance or liquidity. Um, and then particularly we have high input prices becoming really significant from uh, July uh, through September and becoming the, the most significant challenge that people report. Next slide, please. Uh, so I can illustrate this quite nicely with some, some quotes. So we, we asked open-ended questions about the, the challenges that people were facing. Um, and these are all quotes taken from uh, March and April during the, the lockdown period when people were facing uh, problems with transport movement restrictions and as access to inputs. Uh, so the first quote here says that the major customers I produce for are in Lagos. Uh, the shutdown of businesses in Lagos therefore affected my business very negatively as there was no demand for broilers from my customers. So this is showing how sort of lockdowns implemented in urban areas uh, spill over to, to rural areas in terms of their effect. Um, the next quote says, we lost over 50 birds due to the inability of my staff to go and take care of them as required because of the lockdown. So this is illustrating the kind of problems that our restrictions on movement for workers has caused. And we have health farm saying getting feed at the right time was a challenge. I usually go through exchanges and explanations with the security personnel. So again, indicating uh, the, the impacts in terms of sort of timely access to, to inputs and then sort of security issues um, and that again in the, the final one so the police keep extorting money from drivers whenever there are state imposed movement restrictions even when the drivers have a permit for essential services so this is a very common complaint amongst uh, many of the, the people that we interview uh, next slide please so moving into august september we have a, a different set of challenges emerging to do with low demand and cash flow problems and rising prices. Um, so the first quote here is, uh, things haven't normalized following the pandemic, so people aren't buying eggs so much. I had to begin sales of other commodities like Gary, which is a, a form of porridge, so a, a less nutritious, cheaper food. Um, the next quote says, uh, increased costs and difficulty in sourcing feeds as companies are also finding it difficult to produce. So we find um, increasing numbers of feed mills closing uh, and increasing costs of, of uh, feed ingredients. Um, and then the next quote is, for, this is for a feed supplier, customers had to be convinced to purchase feed as most customers quit farming and the ones still in business were contemplating quitting too. So this is quite a worrying trend. We see increasing number of food producers actually um, starting to, to halt their operations as the pandemic progresses. Um, and then finally, I had to start downsizing and putting enough funds to offset the cost of running the business at full scale. This is another very uh, sort of typical uh, comment that we get sort of later on during the, the progress of, of the pandemic. Next slide, please. And, and this is showing the, the number of operational businesses, by month, or rather the share of operational businesses by month, uh, by state. And really, you can see there's a, a, a gradual downward trend uh, as time progresses. Next slide, please. Another important point is that um, very, very little assistance was received. So even at the peak of, of the lockdown period, uh, less than 2% of all our respondents reported receiving any kind of assistance. And it was nearly all informal. There was uh, little support from government, from NGOs or, or from business associations. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, the lockdown initially shut down supply chains, uh, supplying what my colleague Sawida Liverpool calls essential non-essentials. So uh, food supply chains were deemed essential by policymakers and they were supposed to be allowed to stay open, uh, but uh, other things that weren't considered essential, such as logistics, uh, movement of workers, uh, movement of production inputs uh, and markets themselves were, were shut down. Um, so logistic markets uh, started working again quite quickly when these were relaxed. Uh, but demand has remained slow and as a result, businesses are experiencing cash flow problems, uh, increasing numbers of businesses are closing and costs are rising. So there's been a lag effect of the initial shock. So for instance, uh, this occurred at a time when people were, were planting maize. So maize production is lower than expected this year. Um, inflation has increased as the oil, the oil price has dropped, the currency is devalued, and so pushing up the price of imported inputs and feeds, making feed more expensive, um, and uh, inflation is really rising quite rapidly. 
Um, and we see clearly that government safety nets were not uh, widely implemented um, as people received almost no form of assistance. So the sort of recommendations then are addressing these points. So in, in future um, uh, sort of crisis situations to recognize that these, these supporting lateral value chains, supplying inputs into production are essential, uh, keeping markets working safely, um, and and just providing loans to financial support to businesses in the supply chain and then uh, really expanding um, rolling out larger social safety nets. Next slide, please. Okay, so that, that's the end of the presentation. If you'd like to know more about any of this research, there's a, a World Fish 19 webpage with a, a series of, of reports and publications on it. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I think that uh, Ben's research uh, really shows the value of high frequency uh, data collection uh, to get an idea of how the constraints uh, evolve over time. Uh, you know, initially the movement restrictions and then later um, access to inputs and high cost of inputs and uh, lower demand. So uh, now it's time to open up for the Q&A session. And uh, so I invite all the um, speakers to turn on your webcams and, and keep them on for the remainder of the event. Um, please continue to submit your questions through the question box and we will do our best to, uh, to address them. Um, okay, let me open the question list here. Um, okay. Um, let's see, for um, Kale, uh, this one question. Um, your results in Ethiopia um, suggested that uh, many households report a loss of income, um, but that the diets haven't changed a lot. Uh, I'm wondering, does that, uh, do you have any information or do, do you, uh, does this uh, suggest that they are spending less on non-food goods and services or are they economizing in some other way? How are they able to maintain the same diet if their incomes are um, dropping significantly? This is an excellent question uh, and, and really at the kind of heart of, 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 of our research and try to, to understand really what's going on. So I'm happy to elaborate more on that. So I think one, one key issue here is that this income shock measure that we have may not be very good in detecting the magnitude of the income shock. So the, the response options were much less, whether the incomes were much less, less the same uh, and so forth uh, in, the, in the last month over compared to a, a similar month in, in other times. So it could be that some, for some res respondents much, much less is, is 50% income shock, for, whereas for others it's a 5% income shock. So that's, that's the problem in this kind of subjective categories. They might really change uh, between respondents or the meaning of those. Uh, previous research also with these types of shock measures uh, have shown that some respondents uh, respond more about their concerns about future uncertainty rather than the actual income shock. So there are lots of problems in these types of uh, income shock measures, but it, it seems that given that many households did report the shock, uh, that their incomes did go down uh, during, during the first couple of months of the pandemic. Uh, but we are not sure how. What are the magnitudes? Uh, the 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 other uh, explanation, what the, the uh, that the, the that is suggested here, is that the, maybe they are spending less on non-food and food goods and services. Is, is is also a good one. We we don't really know. We didn't collect this type of data uh, on on non-food uh, consumption and non-food goods and services because we didn't collect the same data before the pandemic began, so we couldn't really compare uh, the situation before and during the pandemic. So it might well be that the households reduced consumption of non-food uh, goods and services either because they couldn't afford uh, them anymore or because some of these were not supplied anymore. You can think of some services not being available anymore. So I think there's a lot of questions that we still need to answer, but I think our results strongly suggest that the food security situation or the food value chains in Addis really didn't collapse entirely during this pandemic. And that's good news. Yeah, that is good news. Um, okay, um, uh, thank you. Um, so the next question is from uh, Christian Luger from uh, Delft University in, in the Netherlands. Um, she has a question for, for Sutan. Um, she asks, uh, is there an indication 
uh, that COVID is affecting the Karif planting uh, in terms of availability of farm inputs, lack of capital, delay in planting. Um, she is also interested in um, whether uh, you believe that there, the system is resilient. Do you think that uh, it will return to normal uh, this next season or next year? Or what's what are the um, what's the prognosis for recovery, assuming that uh, you know, COVID-19 can be brought under control. Suda? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, it raises an issue that I didn't have time to discuss. One of the things that the government and many other commentators have been uh, saying is that uh, the agriculture became the fallback option when the rest of the economy was collapsing. And uh, the evidence that was given, uh, so Kharif sowing starts around uh, May, J uh, June. Uh, and they started seeing increasing sowing acreage. So this was seen as a positive sign that uh, expanded acreage was actually a sign that agriculture was not affected. Now, it turns out that as we kept tracking the increase in acreage sown, by August, uh, it started off being 20% higher than usual. By August, it, had, it narrowed down to 5%. So as you say, there was a kind of a delay in planting because of some constraints, but by end of uh, Karif sowing, actually it had caught up to virtually previous levels. Uh, in our survey, as well as uh, surveys by others on farming communities, suggests that input prices had gone up uh, a great deal, especially of chemical fertilizers and seeds, uh, but availability was more of a constraint. And it looks like the way in which uh, farm households adapted was actually on the labor end. Uh, so rather than hiring in labor, a lot of them employed family, uh, their own labor. And we had a lot of news about how Olympic gold medalists were now going back to their farm for the first time because uh, they were helping out their families. So uh, while that, that was happening because of labor shortage, many households with the labor surplus saved on higher labor costs to uh, adapt. On the question of what this all means, I think we need to look carefully at cropping patterns because on the one hand, we saw cash crop uh, acreage increase, which suggests that people, farmers were optimistic that there would still be markets uh, that would recover for cash crops. But we also saw area under coarse grains increase, which is a sign of distress rather than of optimism mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they were growing coarse cereals for food consumption. Uh, and that that's a, that's a big issue. And I think that relates to the second part of your question. Uh, is the system resilient? I think of the system being resilient, but with vulnerable people. So I think of a resilient system with vulnerable people. And in terms of the prospects for recovery, uh, I don't think we have clear data to suggest uh, a prognosis that's based on evidence. Uh, but my sense is that uh, we are not, we have not seen the the worst is not over yet. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot will depend on whether uh, 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 farm households in India, agriculture households derive thirty two percent of their income from wage work. So unless wage work recovers, we are not going to see farm households do go back to business as usual. And until they do that, and I think this may be something to look at in Ethiopia as well, we are finding that any money that comes in goes into savings because people are worried about whether they'll have money in the future. Mm -hmm. So you, you're going to have increased incomes going into savings and food is not going to come enough into the market and they will take care of their own food security. And that may be one of the reasons we are also seeing inflation now even though consumer demand has collapsed so i think that there's a lot a lot of stuff going on there and we just see a little bit here in uh, we see clues uh, india is also very heterogeneous so it's hard to come up with one kind of prognosis mm -hmm. but i think we need to watch mm -hmm. out for movement of commodities people and prices together mm -hmm. okay great uh, thank you suda um ben a uh, question for you um the uh, your your presentation focused on uh, Nigeria, um, but you mentioned in the beginning that this was, or at least that there was one of the two surveys, one of the two projects uh, covered uh, fish value chains in what was it five other countries. And um, so, uh, do you have any? results to say whether the uh, impact of COVID-19 on the other five countries, did it follow a similar pattern to what you saw in Nigeria or 
uh, or were there differences? I realize maybe that yeah. those results aren't aren't ready yet, but uh, just curious about them. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Yeah. So I was very struck listening to Suda's presentation actually um, about how many similarities there are between how things unfolded in India and how things unfolded in Nigeria. Um, and so if you look across the six countries, Nigeria is the country that has the the most severe uh, impact. Um, so you see really the number of businesses operating, for instance, really drops off a cliff in, in April, May. Um, and for the, the, the next closest country, uh, is India. I would say in, in, the, in India we see things starting to recover um, some more quickly, although we see a bit of a dip also uh, in our figures in, in July, August, that I, I think probably with sort of second wave of, of cases. Um, so Bangladesh, things are not quite as, as severe as in India, but still pretty severe. Um, in Myanmar, uh, we don't see very big disruptions to begin with. They only really, only really to start to kick in from, from August onwards when there was a sort of big um, second wave and a, and a second national lockdown. Um, and in Egypt, we, we don't see particularly severe patterns there. Um, aquaculture is very seasonal, so as things warm up, uh, the weather gets hotter in, in um, March, April, then people start, start growing fish. Um, and so really that sort of seasonal trends kind of bucks the, the impacts of, of COVID-19 there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Uh, it is interesting, I think, uh, in, in these studies to, to compare across the countries and see um, how, how different the, the impact is. In some cases, a difference in the severity of the you know the COVID-19 incidents, but in many cases it's just different policy re response and um, how quickly or how uh, strictly they uh, impose the lockdown and, and quarantine measures. Um, okay, going back to um, uh, Kali um, in Ethiopia, I, I guess one of the better case scenarios, at least among the ones that we've discussed today. Um, did you uh, collect uh, data for any other um, food indicators? Um, and uh, if so, do these show sort of a similar um, similar results, or uh, or are there differences depending on which uh, dimension of food security you're looking at? Yeah, uh, so we did collect this uh, food insecurity uh, experience scale. Yeah. And uh, in our phone surveys, but we didn't collect this in in, in the pre-pandemic surveys. So again, uh, we wanted to kind of restrict the analysis more on on those indicators that we can really compare over time. Uh, but before but, and after, yeah, mm -hmm. before and during, basically. Uh, so yeah, uh, but but this indicator is basically showing you know Ethiopia is still a low-income country, so there is quite a lot of food insecurity that is uh, reported using this indicator. And uh, but but perhaps importantly during the pandemic the food security situation didn't really change uh, that much from month to month uh, the situation remained fairly stable which kind of perhaps is, is supporting the, the other story the, the, the story coming out of these other indicators that we have mm -hmm. and uh, when you say it didn't really change you're talking specifically about the results from Addis Ababa right uh, do is there uh, any information about the situation in rural areas uh, that might be less affected, but they're also closer to the poverty line and more likely to be, you know, hurt by by uh, any reduction in income? Yeah, exactly. So I think you know um, the food security situation before the pandemic was much much more difficult in in the rural areas to begin with. So I think this is a good concern. There has been a lot of uh, phone surveys conducted by IFPI, the World Bank, other organizations. Uh, and uh, the, the evidence there is kind of similar, at least the World Bank surveys show that uh, the food security situation uh, has remained fairly stable uh, during the pandemic. So they can also compare before and during. Uh, there was, uh, in, in terms of employment, there was a rather big shock in the first months, but also quite quick recovery as well. The big challenge we have in Ethiopia, especially in rural areas, that about 50% uh, of the households in rural areas own a mobile phone, so we cannot mm -hmm. really call. 
uh, many households and, and it's the poorest households that we would really like to get information about. They don't have a phone survey. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty of, of what's really happening for agriculture and, and especially with rural areas. So I think that's something we need to try to figure out how to do better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it seems like uh, one thing that all of these studies have in common is uh, sort of increasing reliance on on phone surveys you know as we're it's difficult to get into the field and difficult to do per, in-person interviews so there's been this kind of explosion in phone um, surveys so for each of you i'm wondering if you can comment on uh the limitations and possible advantages of of phone surveys uh it, i, I I suspect that the length of the questionnaire certainly is one one issue. Um, maybe we'll um, start with uh, Ben. Do you want to um, uh, talk about? Um, do you have a, some comments on on that on pros and cons of the sure. service? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's been a for for all of us, I think, um, and it's been quite challenging to get um, surveys uh, sort of live and um, very. Um, you know, because there's this need to sort of, particularly early on, you know, really capture what was happening in real time to, to sort of understand what was unfolding. Um, and so, as a result, there are, there are some limitations. Um, you know, it's, it's, for us anyway, there wasn't really a way to do a representative sample. We were reliant on prior contacts and on snowballing. Um, so the, the data that we have is is indicative, right? Um, I think one thing that we've seen is um, where there have been recent surveys that have, that have been revealed and you can go back and, and resurvey those people and so you have sort of a, a baseline that that's really very helpful. Um, we didn't have that that luxury here. Um, but at the same time bonus that you you know you can reach people without necessarily going to the field um, and so that's, something that we maybe maybe consider in future under certain circumstances so um we're sort of planning a another survey uh not related to covid19 and it's a resurvey of, of fish farmers in bangladesh who were, who were interviewed uh, eight years ago and so there's been quite a lot of attrition um and we've listed the, the people who are no longer farming and so now considering actually trying to run a phone survey of those farmers um, to see why they stopped farming and that's probably something we wouldn't have thought about prior to this so i guess it does open up some some interesting possibilities as well mm -hmm. and what about uh, attrition or refusal was that was that an issue that um, that you faced in, in Nigeria? Um, so it can it can be so so what we did because it's a, a regular survey to so to to sort of incentivize people we transferred a, a small amount of phone credit to them after each round of the survey um, to sort of try and help keep them interested um, so I I think that's been reasonably effective um, nevertheless people do um, drop out and that can be problematic particularly when you have quite small sample sizes. Um, so I guess one lesson we've learned is, you know, we had lots of different um, value chain segments in in each country, and therefore quite small numbers of people in each segment. And then, so if you have people, you know, it's it's a problem if you have attrition when you have really small sample sizes. So I think that's another a lesson learned. It's probably better to focus on um, fewer um, segments in the supply chain, but larger numbers of people in in, in each segment. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and uh, Sudha, how about uh, uh, your survey? Is it similar um, uh, experience or uh, and differences? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm somewhat pessimistic about phone surveys. Uh, I uh, we had already visited these households as part of other surveys and not mm -hmm. very uh, too far in the past. So uh, we did have uh, we we were optimistic when we went in, uh, but I think at times of crisis we found that uh, recharging your phone and keeping credit there is one of the least priorities. Uh, mm -hmm. So we could reach half of them. So in fact, our response rate was one third of the numbers we had. Uh, mm. So only we could only get through 33% of them. Uh, and this is quite a contrast to other phone surveys that have happened in India, which show much better response rates. 
but uh, people were always willing to speak uh, so we didn't have a problem there uh, but uh, we really had to uh, rework our plans to uh, away from a representative survey of any sort because of the mm -hmm. uh, the, the res response rates uh, mm -hmm. i do believe it's valuable when you can't go to the field and you un want to understand better what's going on um, i probably have to learn a lot more about uh, getting it right uh, uh, yeah, we, we had a shoestring budget and student volunteers, uh, but I think I have a long way there. And uh, I feel in, uh, working with that in India in the current context is challenging because people are quite uh, uh, wary of who you are, where you're calling from mm -hmm. and why, uh, because of the political right. issues as well. Sure. Uh, these yeah. were the issues we faced. Mm -hmm. So basically, they were willing to talk once you got through to them, but a lot of them were not answering or the phone number wasn't uh, yeah. uh wasn't valid yeah okay um and how about you Kali? um i think you mentioned in your um presentation that the response the attrition was relatively low is this is this based on um a list that you had before the survey yeah so we were extremely fortunate of just having finished an end line to a representative survey in addis ababa where we had phone numbers for all respondents. So uh, I, I think we were just very lucky and be able to kind of start over uh, again in May with the phone survey. So the attrition rate was, was very low, at less than 5% at the end. Uh, and that was probably because we, we had built a good relationship with these households, interviewed them many times, the same enumerators, and we had an uh, excellent survey team as well. So all of these, these things mattered. And uh, so I think yeah, I'm not sure how much you can extrapolate. We just had a very lucky setup for this. Mm -hmm. well, I think that illustrates the importance of uh, that trust. You know, as Hudo was saying, they don't know who you are. I mean, if you're just calling them for the first time, they don't know who you are and you know why you're calling if you're really doing research. But if this is a, a follow-up survey and you can say, we talked to you uh, two months ago, then it's, uh, you, your results are much better. Um, Okay, um, and uh, 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 Sutai, I wanted to go back to uh, something else you mentioned in um, just in, in talking about the differences across sectors. You said that um, plantation crops were much more uh, adversely affected than than other crops. Um, is why is that? Is that related to labor availability or other issues? Uh, actually, it's unfortunate, and I wish I didn't have to say that, but it's actually a, a failure of the government to think through the regulations carefully. So even mm -hmm. after, they, um, after the lockdown, they started issuing notifications permitting different kinds of activities. And uh, cultivation came in first, but the plantation sector remained without any uh, relaxations until uh, two weeks into the uh, lockdown. And some mm. states which relied a lot on tea and coffee plantations, they issued their own notifications to allow uh, some basic activities to continue. But the other plantation crops like rubber, araca nut, and the whole host of other crops, uh, it was almost three weeks after the lockdown that uh, the government permitted activities and had clear instructions. So here there was, I think, a kind of a blind spot with the plantation sector that affected it adversely. Um, there was, uh, in some parts, the migrant labor availability was also an issue, but it was predominantly because uh, it was uh, the lockdown was enforced uh, severely, and uh, these were seen as activities that were not going, not uh, not permitted, and uh, that was the way it was interpreted by local authorities. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's a lot of um, uh, discussion in the press and elsewhere about the severity of the lockdown uh, that occurred initially. If, uh, God forbid, that there was uh, a need for another lockdown, do you think that the government is in a better position to know how to, um, you know, maximize the the health benefits without uh, having as adverse an effect on on the economy? Are there lessons that have been learned and uh, are being discussed? Uh this is again an interesting question in the context of India because the uh, state governments are actually responsible for agricultural mm. uh, activities and markets. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So in some ways, when the center imposed a lockdown, many states had already had a had a plan that wouldn't affect the sectors too much while being consistent with a lockdown that would protect health. So the center, in fact, their lockdown came on top of what states were doing. So mm. I see that should there be a lockdown in the future, I think it would be useful for the center to take the lessons that states had already implemented and planned, but couldn't uh -huh. implement because the center kind of over overrode all of their uh, laws. So I think there's one learning from experience by the center itself, but also learning from the states and st states learning from each other. Uh, uh -huh. Because of the federal setup, uh, I think these uh, yeah you need you need lessons from all directions and time yeah. I guess yeah. yeah yeah well I think the whole experience of dealing with the pandemic is not something that uh, many governments have uh, have experience with and so um, um, hopefully this uh, this experience will provide some some lessons and we can uh, uh, learn from it. Um, Okay, uh, well, I think that we are um, out of time. Just checking to see if there's any last questions that uh, uh, that have come in. Um, okay, no, I think uh, I think that's I think we've covered most of the questions. Um, so um, anyway, um, thank you everybody for um, for your uh, presentations and thank you to the um, members of the um, audience for for your questions. Um, so um, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll stop now. Um, but uh, I want to give um, Frank Place uh, an opportunity to make uh, some closing remarks. Uh, Frank is the director of the CGR Research Program on Policies, Institutions and Markets, PIM. Um, and uh, he will provide some closing remarks. Uh, okay, over to you. Okay. Frank. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, yeah, I'll be very brief because I know everybody's got a busy schedule ahead of them today. So thanks again to the presenters, uh, Ben and Kale and Suda. Um, you know, these are studies of significance with relatively large samples covering important parts of the va of value chains in very large countries. Impacts in these countries will have regional and global spillovers as well. So there's keen interest into the understanding the effects of COVID-19 and government responses in these in these three uh, examples that we heard from today. They also deploy a range of temporal and spatial analyses. And, and and unpack findings according to different contextual characteristics. And I really appreciated those. Um, I, for example, we heard uh, from the high frequency price data over several years uh, and market activity from India, which is quite shows quite convincing uh, the uh, impacts of COVID-19 on different commodities. The monthly data that uh, was surveyed in Nigeria on fish and poultry sh showed how challenges evolve over time as restrictions were rolled out and then eased. And in Ethiopia, we learned that the relationship between COVID-19 direct and indirect effects on food consumption seem to be quite consistent across different types of households, which is also important. So all these deep dives seem to really help to provide clearer insights into recommendations for decision makers. I think we did hear um, from all of them that there's um, you know, important uh, policy responses on the demand side to try to boost aggregate demand as, as much as possible through uh, social protection and other, other kinds of government involvement that we heard of uh, in the case of India. Uh, but that won't guarantee losers of certain co in commodities and as there have been differential effects on commodities that we've seen. So on the supply side, um, keeping markets functioning may, uh, um, may, may re result in different types of uh, support measures. Uh, and, and some that don't necessarily eat it into public finances are enhancing credit facilities that we heard um, from one of the speakers to support those uh, in temporary temporary need and um, public investments are also needed around support digital technologies we've heard some response from that as for example investing in ict infrastructure and having enabling regulations and stimulating awareness and use of these so those are among some of the things that we heard today um, what i would say as a final point is that since we know that other uh, studies related to COVID-19 are taking place in the same countries and possibly involving some of the same researchers. <laughs> um, our next step seems to be to see if there could be deeper understanding of COVID impacts and implications for action 
uh, through, uh, you, you know, whether those could be identified through some rapid synthesis of findings across the different studies. So one thing that's happening within the CGIR, there is a new uh, a relatively recent COVID hub that's been established, and they're proposing to undertake some of these kinds of syntheses, but I would encourage uh, all of you and others to explore such opportunities in your countries. Um, so that's all I really had to say, and uh, I'll just close by saying I wish everyone a happy closing to 2020 and a good start to 2021. So back to you, Nick. Great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers for their remarks today uh, and also the audience uh, for attending. Uh, if you would like to send comments or questions about today's seminar, please contact PIM versus, uh, via the email uh, addresses on the screen. Um, and uh, the event uh, recording, the recording of the event and the slides will be available on the PIM website, which is pim.cgir.org. Uh, so that's it for today. Hope uh, everyone has a great day. Thank you very much.